about vector spaces. Simply put, a vector is any entity that involves both magnitude and direction. You can see from the picture here that we can think of a vector as an arrow. For example, we might start at the origin, which we'll denote as the point 0, 0, and then we'll draw out to some point A, which here on the slide you'll see is denoted by 2, 3. In general, it might be some A1, A2. Well, the direction here and the magnitude of this arrow is exactly what we're calling a vector. We'll usually denote this by a bold letter. In this case, we'll denote it by a bold letter, capital A. The collection of all such vectors we'll denote as R superscript 2. That is, we really want pairs of real numbers, namely A1 and A2. There are a couple of other ways in which you can think of a vector. On the left, you'll see here that we have our arrow, capital A, and we can break it into two components by looking at what happens when we plot this in the Cartesian plane. We have a certain direction in the x-axis, which in this case we'll denote by A sub x. We also have another direction in the y-axis, which we'll denote by A sub y. Well, in both cases, you can see now that really here we do have a magnitude and a direction. The magnitude of this vector you'll see on the right-hand side, which just comes about from this right triangle. Here we're using the Pythagorean theorem. So the magnitude of the vector is just the square root of ax squared plus ay squared. Again, we're just looking here at the hypotenuse of this right triangle. On the other hand, the angle theta tells us about the direction of this vector. So the direction here, of course, you can figure out by looking at the rise over run, so namely ay divided by ax, which should just be tangent of the angle. So again, we can just figure out what the angle is just by looking at how far along the x-axis we go and how far along the y-axis we go. So more generally, if we have a vector, which we'll denote by our bold letter a, we can determine its magnitude by the square root of a1 squared plus a2 squared. And putting all of this together, we can now figure out what the angle is, just like before, by looking at what happens when we plot this as a right triangle. If we have a vector capital A, we can figure out the angle, which in this case we'll denote by a capital alpha. Just a small remark, since this is something that we're going to only skim over here in this class. We typically think of our vectors as points, namely a1 and a2. Yes, we did say before that we really do care about magnitude and direction. So the idea is that, yes, we do want to think of them as points, but really it's better to think of them as arrows. This is because we need to know where is our starting point and where is our ending point. Well, typically, if we just have a point, a1, a2, we just think of the starting point as the origin namely 0, 0, so that when we do that, we can really think of every point, namely a lowercase a, the same as being a vector. In this case, we've written it as bold letter a. There's a couple of different operations that we care to do when we're dealing with vectors. The first of the two is addition. If we have two vectors, which we'll denote by capital bold letter a and bold letter b, then the sum of the two vectors we can draw here in terms of what's called the parallelogram law. You'll see that we've drawn our vector in red as a bold letter A, and we've drawn a new vector as B in terms of a blue vector. And when we put both of these together, we can now form a parallelogram where the main diagonal of this parallelogram is our new vector, which is in purple, A plus B. This gives us a nice geometric way of thinking of the addition of two vectors. We can also think of addition as an operation which goes from pairs of R2 cross R2 into R2. Namely, this is just a fancy way of saying that if you give me a pair of vectors, namely bolt letter A and bolt letter B, then this will return a unique vector, bolt letter A plus bolt letter B. The idea of this operation is something that we're going to come back to over and over again here throughout the course. The second of the two operations is scalar multiplication. 
If you're given a vector, bolt letter A, and a real number T, we can then take a look at the scalar multiple T times the vector A as follows. Remember that a vector has two components. There's a direction and there's a magnitude. So first, let's just simply define the magnitude of our vector t times vector a as the absolute value of t, remember that t is a real number, times the magnitude of the vector a. That again gives us the magnitude. But now the direction is the part that we have to be a little bit careful about. What we'll say is, if t is positive, then t times a has the same direction as vector a, but if t is negative, then t times a has the opposite direction as vector a. You can see this here on the slide. Here we have vector a. In this case, we've moved slightly differently than what we had before. We put a little arrow above the letter a, really just to remind us that it's a vector. We can multiply by t is equal to 2 to look at twice the vector a. It's in the same direction as the original vector a, but now it's twice as long. On the other hand, we can look at negative 1 times a. In this case, it's just the vector negative a. And you'll see that this is moving in the opposite direction as the vector a. This is what we mean by the direction of our vectors. Just like before, we can think of scalar multiplication as an operation that maybe takes a real number and a vector and it returns another vector. That is, it'll take a real number t and a vector a, and it'll return the unique vector t times a. Now with these two operations, namely vector addition and scalar multiplication, we have the following eight properties for two-dimensional vectors. First, we have commutativity. That means given any two vectors, x and y, the sum x plus y is the same as the sum y plus x. We have associativity of addition. Namely, if I first add x and y and then add z, that is the same as adding y plus z and then adding x. In other words, the order in which we do our operation doesn't really matter. Next, we have an identity. That is, our vector at the origin, where we're calling our bold letter O, satisfies x plus O is equal to x. So we'll say here that O is the zero vector. We then have additive inverses. That is, if we're given a vector x, we can take a look at the opposite of x, that is negative x, where if we add x plus negative x, we will get back the zero vector. We then have an identity for scalar multiplication. If we scale by the number 1, we just get back to where we started from. That is, x is always equal to 1 times x for any vector x. We have associativity, very similar to what happened with addition, but now it's associativity of scalar multiplication. Given two real numbers, a and b, we can first multiply by a times b, which is a real number, then scale that by the vector x. Or what we could do is we could first scale x by the real number b, and then scale that vector by the real number a. So the order in which we do our scaling does not matter. We have distributivity for vector addition. This gives us a way to combine these two operations, vector addition and scalar multiplication. This property says that if I take the vector x plus y and then scale by a, that's the same thing as first scaling x by a, then scaling y by a, and adding those two resulting vectors together. And finally, we have distributivity for scalar multiplication. Given two real numbers a and b, and a vector x, we can say first add a plus b, which is another real number, and then scale the vector x by that real number. This is the same as scaling x by a, scaling x by b, and then adding those two resulting vectors together.
Now what we'd like to do is generalize all of these ideas. So first, let's generalize from the real numbers to another set of numbers. In this class, we'll call this a field. We're not going to worry about the very general definition, but what we're going to say is in this class, there will be three types of fields that will be of interest to us. First, we may consider the collection of rational numbers, that is just ratios of integers. So such examples will be one third, two fifths, so on. We'll denote this set by Q. Q of course stands for quotients of integers. We can also let F be the collection of real numbers which we'll denote by this bold letter R. Or we can let F be the collection of complex numbers. These are numbers in the form A plus BI, where I is the square root of minus one. If you're not comfortable with the complex numbers now, don't worry, we'll come back and we'll study these in much more detail as the course progresses. What you might think that we want to do is generalize the ideas from the previous section so that instead of thinking of pairs, a1, a2, we may think of m tuples, a1, a2, dot, 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 through a sub m. But we're going to do something slightly more general than even this. Now remember that before, we talked about properties of vector addition and scalar multiplication when we wrote down those eight properties before. Now we're going to make a definition based on eight properties that we want to be true. Properties that we want to be true, we're going to call axioms. We'll say that a triple is a vector space if the following eight axioms hold. But by a triple, we actually need three items to work with. First, we'll want V to be a non-empty set. Second, we want plus to be what we'll call vector addition. And third, we want dot to be what we will call scalar multiplication. For the moment, we don't know what these are. Again, we're generalizing what we had before, but we'll end the discussion today by going over some examples of all of this. So again, once we have these three, a non-empty set V, scalar multiplication vector addition plus, and scalar multiplication dot, we want the following eight to be true. First, we want commutativity of vector addition. We'll denote this by VS1 for vector space axiom one. And this is just like before. X plus Y should be the same as Y plus X. Next, we want associativity of our vector addition. So we could take X plus Y and then add Z, or we could take Y plus Z and then add X. Third, we'd like for there to be an identity. That is that there should exist some element that we'll call capital O, such that X plus capital O is X for all X in the set V. We'll call this capital O our zero element. Fourth, we'll want there to be an inverse. What we mean by this is there should be another element which we'll denote by negative X says that x plus negative x is our zero element, capital O. Fifth, we'll want the identity number, the number one, to act like the multiplicative identity. That is, for every x in v, we want x to be equal to one times x. Number six, we want associativity for scalar multiplication to happen. That is, given any two numbers a and b, we could take a times b, which is another number in f, and then we can scale that by our element x. That should be the same as first scaling x by b, and then scaling that by a. Next, we'd like to have distributivity. This gives us a way to relate vector addition and scalar multiplication. So we could take two elements, x and y, add them together, and then scale that by a. This should be the same as first scaling x by a, then scaling y by a, and then adding those two together. And then finally, we like to have distributivity for scalar multiplication. That is, given any two elements a and b, 
we could take a plus b, which is another element in our field f, and scale that by our element x. This should be the same as first scale x by a, then scale x by b, and add those two together. In all of this, you can probably guess that we're calling our elements a and b scalars, and we're calling our elements x and y vectors. This is just the definition that we're giving, so we can say that we're going to generalize all of the ideas from before. So let's end up by going over a few examples here. Now, given a field F, we'll say that the collection of M tuples, remember here we're looking at A1, A2, dot, 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 through A sub M, as an M-dimensional vector space. This here is naturally meant to generalize what we had as R2, as the real plane. It turns out that this is a vector space because we can define vector addition and scalar multiplication in a very natural way. Namely, given two M tuples, bold letter X and bold letter Y, we can add them together by simply adding component wise. So the first component will be A1 plus B1, second component will be A1 plus B2, and so on and so forth. Or we can define scalar multiplication, again, component wise. So if I take a scalar T, multiply that by the vector, bold letter X, then the components will be T times A1, T times A2, and so on. In this case, our zero element, bold letter O, will just be the zero vector. Literally every component is just going to be the real number zero. Let's look at a slightly more general example from that. We can look at the collection of what are called M by N matrices. In this case, we have an array that has M rows and N columns. The previous example just had N is equal to one, just one column, but now we can have as many columns as we would like. We claim that this is also a vector space. To see why, you really have to first write down vector addition and then write down scalar multiplication and finally check that all eight axioms are true. But we'll just mention this very briefly for today. If you're given two M by N matrices, let's call them capital A and capital B, then we can talk about adding everything together component wise. So for example, A plus B, we can write one of the entries as A11 plus B11, we can write another entry as A12 plus B12, so on and so forth. The zero element in this case is the zero matrix. So it's just the matrix that you get by putting in zeros absolutely everywhere. Let's end by going over a rather strange example. This is to emphasize that we really have to be very careful as to the definition that we want to have for scalar multiplication and the definition for vector addition. Instead of considering the whole plane, R2, let's just consider the first quadrant. So this is the region where A1 and A2 are both positive numbers, just the first quadrant of the real plane. Unfortunately, this is not a vector space. One of the simple reasons why is the additive identity does not exist here. Remember that the additive identity before was the vector 0, 0. That is certainly not sitting here in the first quadrant. Moreover, additive inverses fail. For example, if I'm sitting at the point 2, 3, its additive inverse will be negative 2, negative 3. This does not sit in the first quadrant. So if I have a vector in the first quadrant, its inverse does not sit in the first quadrant. So if we worked with the standard, the usual definitions of vector addition and scalar multiplication, we will find that this triple is not a vector space. But here's where the strangeness comes in. There is a way I can choose a vector addition and scalar multiplication so that this will form a vector space.
Instead, let's consider the following operations that I'll write in terms of circle plus and circle dot. Circle plus will be defined by multiplying the components, and circle dot will be defined by exponentiating the components. So for example, if I have a vector bold letter X and another vector bold letter Y, then circle plus says multiply the components A1, B1, and then A2 times B2, and circle dot, T circle dot X, will be A1 raised to the T, comma, A2 raised to the T. Now with these really weird looking definitions, then the zero element now becomes the vector one comma one. Yes, this looks very strange because remember that we have to keep track of these new definitions, the circle plus and the circle dot. So now this zero element in this sense isn't the zero vector, but it's a vector that corresponds to the operation. Now, if we were to go through all eight axioms, then we could actually prove that this triple this set V, that's the first quadrant, this circle plus, which is this weird new vector addition, and this circle dot, which is this weird new scalar multiplication, actually forms a vector space. So we're not going to worry about proving this today, but as we move throughout the course, we will discuss how one actually does prove that such a triple does form a vector space. Thanks for listening.